So uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, we are working through a series called Walking with Jesus. And uh, primarily we're studying about how Jesus models for us a life of prayer uh, with the Father and how we as disciples can grow in the discipline of prayer, uh, looking to Jesus as our example. And then what we want to do is we want to integrate those patterns that prayer of prayer that Jesus uh, showed us in the scriptures, his patterns of prayer and silence and solitude into our own lives, uh, because when we do that, we know that we will be rewarded for our efforts. And we started this series talking about how God desires to hear from us, that he wants to talk with us. He's the one who started the conversation in the first place, and we can have God's ear through Jesus Christ. We can have a conversation with God uh, that is carried out in prayer. And we also learn that God desires to, in prayer, form us, that he shapes us into the likeness of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And prayer is that means of grace. It's a channel through which we are changed, that God strengthens us and he forms us, uh, and it's essential for our spiritual formation. Uh, what an encouragement that can be for any one of us. If you're here wondering whether or not you can have God's ear, the, the fact of the matter is, is that in Jesus Christ we can. You can know with great confidence that God hears your prayers. And that he speaks to us through his word. Last week, Ricky uh, unpacked for us uh, Jesus' pattern of private prayer. That the gospel writers highlighted for us that if private prayer was essential for the Lord Jesus Christ, then it must be equally as essential for his disciples. And Ricky taught last week that as a disciple of Jesus, we must be intentional about talking with God. Amid a busy world, he said, God invites us to focus on what matters the most, which is time with him. As we are with every other relationship in our life, so also we ought to be as intentional in our relationship with God. I love this quote last week. I asked Ricky, I, I copy-pasted it from his manuscript. He said this, he said, Jesus planned for prayer to be something he did every day. And prayer has to make it into our schedules and our practices or it will never happen. Prayer will simply remain an idea and not a reality in our life. So much of our life is dictated by schedules and patterns and rhythms. And unless we fix something in our calendar, unless we work intentionally to build it into our life, things just don't happen. Change just doesn't happen to us. We, we have to intentionally go after that. And so this morning, we're going to continue to look at Jesus' private prayer. And we're going to look at the private life briefly of Jesus leveraging silence and solitude, being alone with his father and how that played a significant role in his ministry and his relationship with his father. Because uh, when we look at Jesus and we look at his pattern, the role of silence and solitude played such a significant role uh, that we ought to look at that and say, okay, how does getting away benefit us? How does the Lord reward us when we do that? Now, here's what I want you to just hopefully understand. Sometimes you can come into a sermon series and you can think, oh, here we go again. Here's, we're just, we need to pray more, duly noted. Our intent, my intent, is not to burden you with a guilt so that you'll pray more. My heart is that you would love Jesus more and be convinced that prayer and pulling away is something that we do not because we have to, but because you will be richly rewarded in your relationship with God. That's, that's the end goal. The end goal is that you might be convinced that when we open up these things in Scripture, that you'll be like, man, if I do these things, my heart will be full with the love of God. And that over time, that you will develop patterns, not because you're going to please God more, but because you're going to know God more. And so that's our heart. It's about growing in our love in our friendship with Jesus. So this morning, let me uh, look really quickly. Uh, there's, there's so much on this in prayer and in, in, in terms of silence and solitude uh, that I can't, I can't just, I'm not going to dump a dump truck up on you. But I do want to take a look at, at a few things. One, I want to look at what the Bible says about silence and solitude. What does the scripture, Jesus' Bible, what did it say that he understood about being alone with God. And then I want to look at what Jesus taught about it. He took the scriptures and he taught about what it means to be in relationship with the Father. How do we talk to him? How do we spend time with him? And what did Jesus teach about it? How did he model it? 
Uh, what did he teach his disciples about it? And then I want to sh- point us to just really simple things of how we can pursue, as disciples of Jesus, uh, pursue a life marked with prayer. And how do we integrate silence and solitude over time into even our own busy lives, being parents, uh, being employed, being students. And this isn't just for adults. This is for those of you who are uh, 12 years old, 8 years old, 15 years old, and in love with Jesus and want to know Jesus more. And so that's the end goal. Uh, Psalm 62 First, what does the Bible say about silence and solitude? I'm just going to skim uh, a few passages. And when we look at the scriptures, it, it seems that God accomplishes quite a bit uh, through us and in us when we carve out time to be alone with him. Silence tends to be the catalyst for his help. Uh, in Psalm 62, verses 1 through 2, uh, David writes, I am at rest in God alone. My silence, uh, my salvation comes from him. Uh, The ESV says, for God alone, my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. That when we're silent and before God, that God is our salvation. Um, In the Old Testament, the word stillness or the Hebrew word for still, there's a couple different ones. But the the word uh, that's used for stillness or silence or inactivity is used more than 40 times. When it's used as a verb, it's Shabbat, which is the word Sabbath, it's a ceasing, a resting from work. It is a silence that comes with the stillness. It is pausing and ceasing from doing things that have us busy and active. The word is used in Psalm 4610. Be still. Another translation, stop fighting, stop wrestling. Be still and know that I am God. That I'm exalted among the nations and exalted on the earth. Where there's stillness, where there's Shabbat, there is silence. Many texts in the Old Testament celebrate Yahweh's power to silence and calm where there is noise and turmoil. I used to work at a uh, place called Leaps and Bounds, which was a birthday party place in high school. Does anybody remember Leaps and Bounds? It's a birthday party place, similar to Chuck E. Cheese's. And what we would do is the strategy was this. We would convince parents that you could bring your kids to uh, this this gerbil-looking thing where it's like there's pipes and balls and ropes and swinging, and we would fill them with red punch, feed them with birthday cake and candy, and they could just run around like crazy. It's absolutely bonkers, but it works because we were packed all the time. I was a birthday party uh, I don't know what I was, a birthday party leader, but my job was to get the kids as excited and as filled with sugar as possible, have them have a good time, sing happy birthday, and then send them on their way. It was anything but silence and solitude, right? You know, sometimes our houses feel like that, depending on how many kids you have, uh, running around in the home. Uh, we all know what birthday parties are like. Have you ever had a birthday party where you've invited the whole family and all the kids are running around and it's just like absolute chaos? Well, that is what life is like sometimes. There's, there's noise all the time. And, and, and while parties are fun and we're supposed to enjoy life, there's this sense of chaos and movement and just absolute distraction. And the word that God uses for silence and stillness is the same word that is used when uh, in Job 26, 12, that, that by his power he stilled the seas. He, he calmed the seas. And in fact, in Mark chapter 4, verse 39, it's the same word that Jesus used. Jesus stands up to the boat. If you're familiar with this, the disciples are with Jesus. They're in the boat, and a storm comes onto the lake. And all of a sudden, these guys are fishermen. They're not, they're not a bunch of sissies, and they're scared for their lives. And Jesus is just taking a nap in the boat. And, it, and at one point, Jesus is woken up by the disciples, and they're like, dude, do you not care about what's going on? And he, like, wipes the sleep from his eyes, looks around, stands up, and says, be still. And all of a sudden, the seas calm. And that's why they were so amazed. It's, it's one of the first moments in the Gospels where the disciples look at him, and they're like, this guy is not who we think he is. Who is he? Because only Yahweh can still the seas. He can still the, the seas that are raging in our souls. 
Now, we may not have the power to still the sea. Sometimes we want to control life. We think that if we work harder, that if we simply just just think harder, if we uh, have more money, it, we can control life. But we do not have the power to still the seas. But but we do have the power to go to where God wants to talk to us, where the raging sea in our heart is is just absolutely bonkers. You know, you know, some of us, some of you right now in your hearts, in your soul, you have this internal raging sea that needs to be calmed. Our hearts are agitated. Uh, many in our culture, in our society, are mentally and emotionally unhealthy. It's a sickness in our society. And my question to you is, when you come into this room, what's going on in your soul right now? 12-foot breakers on the sea, if you've ever seen them, if you've ever seen seas that are, are just absolutely torn by the wind, and it's just 12-foot breakers are great for surfers, but they're not great for the soul. What, do you, what, what is raging in your soul right now? Are you not at rest? Some of you are at rest. Some of you are not. There is a need for reflection with God. Psalm 4, 3 through 4 says that, Know that the Lord has set apart the faithful for himself. The Lord will hear when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. David says, reflect in your heart while on your bed. And there's that word, be silent. The silence there is a deliberate silence. That word there is, is often used sometimes for those who can't hear and those who can't speak. But this silence is, is intended for someone that can hear and speak, but they need to stop speaking. Be silent. The same word is carried over into the New Testament in Revelation chapter 8.1 when there's a, a pause of silence in the heavens. There's this eerie silence between one season and the next season. Like, like the, the silence between tornadoes that have just ripped between in, in a town. It is that eerie calm before the storm. It's the wor- that's the word that it's used there. It's a freedom from outward disturbance. It's a silence and a stillness that gives opportunity to not only trust in God's providential rule, but to display our faith in God. The Bible is clear that what happens in the Old Testament and what Jesus carried through, and we'll look at it in a moment, is that when we are silent and still, what we display is not weakness, but we actually display an absolute trust in a sovereign God who is at work. Some of you can't stop working because you're afraid of what happens if you do. And it could be vocational. It could be working in your family. It could be working on some sort of project. It could be working at a relationship. And some of you are running on this treadmill, and you're trying to do and do and do, and you have failed to stop and say, okay, I can't do any more. I'm going to stop and I'm going to go to the Lord. It's counterintuitive to our culture these days. We are Americans, daggummit. We pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and we do. It doesn't work. When we go to God in prayer, Jesus' Bible taught him that when we rest in God, Rest in God alone, Psalm 62, 5. Rest in God alone, my soul. He talks to himself. He says, rest in God, be silent, and trust the Lord. The question that I have for you this morning is, do you trust God? Do you trust him? If you trust God, then your life, like Jesus's, was marked and will be marked with more prayer, not less. Our trust in God is something like, you know, like, I've got faith in God, so I'm just going to, like, I'm going to throw a prayer up there, and I'm just going to walk through life. I'm just not going to, you know, I'm not going to pause. I'm not going to rest. That's actually counter to trusting God. Trusting God is like, I'm going to do what I can. I'm actually going to spend more time with him because in the seasons of life when I have to engage in vocation, and I have to engage with my family, I also have to engage with where my heart and my soul is at with God. God has created us for that. Those three different realms of activity. Jesus had a vocation. He had a job. You have a job. Jesus had family and friends. You have family and friends. You have to sit with yourself and deal with yourself and your heart and your soul and that voice that's in your head telling you all sorts of things. You have three categories in which you need God's strength. And so Jesus models for us how do we navigate that. So let's look now to what Jesus taught. So the Old Testament scriptures are clear that 
the silence and the stillness and the, and the, the, the pulling back from activities actually the way in which God allows us to hear his voice. It's how we display trust in him. And then he gives us salvation in those moments because what we're doing is we're, we're, we're giving opportunity for God to speak. God speaks through his word. Jesus modeled this for us too. How did Jesus apply this activity of silence and solitude? Because Jesus read the scriptures and he knew as a human, this is how I'm created to be in relationship with God. I must pray. I have to engage in work and I have to pray. Turn with me to Matthew 6, chapter 5. This is a familiar text for many of you. It's where the Lord's Prayer is taught. It'll be up on the screen, but uh, the reason why we give you Bibles is so that you can actually open it and navigate a Bible and, and remember how to, uh, how to find things in, in the text. Jesus uh, is teaching his disciples, and uh, he starts in chapter 6 talking about practicing their, your righteousness. If you're a follower of Jesus and you're his disciple, he's saying, you know, you don't need to practice your righteousness in front of others. And he talks about giving. And he says, you know, give in secret. And, and as your father sees you in secret, you don't have to be like, hey, everybody, I'm writing this check for $500. Yeah, I'm putting it in the offering plate. Jesus is like, don't do that. Do it in secret. And then he transitions to prayer. He says, whenever you pray, verse 5, whenever you pray, the expectation there, the way in which this is written in the Greek, Jesus is saying, I'm expecting you to pray. You're to give a, your thanks to God. You're to talk to God. Whenever you pray, you must not like, be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by people. He says, I tell you, they have their reward. They're going to get rewarded by the compliments of, oh, you, you guys must be really good Christians. You pray out loud all the time. Verse 6, but when you pray, again, there's that expectation. When you pray, we are expected to pray. When you pray, how do we do that? Go into your private room. Withdraw. Go to the secret. In private rooms, there's, there's no one speaking to you. Back in the day, he, didn't, he, he probably would have said, go into your private room, turn off your notifications. In fact, power down your phone maybe? I don't know. Turn it off. Shut your door and then pray to your father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. There's a reward when we pull away. When you pray, don't babble like the Gentiles. Gentiles was... Uh, translation for unbelievers, they imagine that they're going to be heard for their many words. They're going to chant mantras. They're going to do the Hail Mary. They're going to do these recitings of the Rakas if you're Hindu. You're going to do all of these things. You're going to recite the prayers of uh, the Muslim faith five times a day, the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, and they're going to imagine that God hears them because they have all of these words that they say. It's not true. God hears you because he's your father. And when you pull into this secret, when you pray, don't be like an unbeliever thinking that the more you say, your father's going to respond. But know that your father knows what you need before you go in there. Isn't that encouraging? This is why, like, friends, if you're carrying the burden of sin and, you, and you're just failing to confess it, this is why you carry that burden. It's God knows what you're carrying. You don't have, you confess it to him for your own sake. It's not that he doesn't know. You know, whenever I confess my sin, I don't say to God, hey, God, I know this is going to shock you, but I was a little bit angry at my family the other day. No. God's like, yeah, I was there. I saw it, the whole thing. How's your, how are you doing with that? I'm not doing so well. Well, let's talk, let's talk about that. I feel guilty. I feel ashamed. Well, do you want to you want to be healed from that that feeling? I do. Okay. Well, remember what I said about your sin being taken care of by my son. We're rewarded when we go in and we're honest about what we're carrying. And then he gives us the Lord's Prayer, which he says, therefore, you should, plural, he's talking to his disciples, and he gives this prayer that is a structure, it's a template. He says, when you pray, you should pray like this, our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day, provide for us this day our daily bread. 
forgive me my sins. Forgive us our debts as we also will forgive or have forgiven our debtors. Please do not test my faith. Do not bring me into temptation, but, but deliver me from the evil one. For yours is added to one gospel, is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I, I orient myself to this template. And Jesus says, when you pray, here's the structure. And if you were to summarize it, here's the summary. Jesus says, listen, withdraw, go to your private room, shut the door, pray, talk, don't babble, and expect to be rewarded. What, what are we going to be rewarded with? With God. You'll be present with God. And you will hear God's response. Tim Keller says it beautifully. He says, those with a genuinely lived relationship with God as their father, not as taskmaster, not as some distant God that's untouchable. Mothers love it when their children come to them and ask for their care, tell them they love them. It, it could be the ugliest card in the world, but you're going to love that card, right? You, you're going to look at it and you're going to be like, my kid scribbled this, and I actually helped them make the card to give me. It's like, I'm giving you money to buy a gift to give back to me to say happy mother. Right? That's just the way it works for a while. Actually, it's still, it's still working that way. I don't even with teenagers. I don't know how that. As father, we will inwardly want to pray. When we talk to God in the secret, there's what Jesus is saying, there's no, there's no disciple that goes into the prayer closet because they're going to get praise you're not getting kudos for praying. When we talk to God even when there's no social or experiential payoff. We pray to God even though we don't feel. You might wrestle with God in prayer because you know he's, he hears you. He's your father. And your reward is simply just knowing that he hears you. You may not experience joy and delight. Maybe sometimes even relief. Sometimes I wrestle for a long time and I just give up. I'm like, I, don't, I want relief from this burden and I'm not feeling it. So I'm just going to move on. But I've told you, God, and you, I know that you hear me, and so I'm just going to assume that in the future you're going to respond in some way that I'm going, to, I'm going to know. And I live in faith. A disciple in private prayer. Here's, here's for those of you who like simplicity and frame. Here we go. Ready? Jesus, you can say it this way. A disciple in private prayer does not have to be long-winded. Which means that you don't have to spend 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes to be a good disciple in prayer. Hey, when you're eating cereal in the morning, rushing off to school, you can take five minutes over your cereal and withdraw and talk to God. You don't have to be long-winded. You can say, God, I have, a, I have a day ahead of me. I've got an exam. Take some time. You don't have to be long-winded. In fact, God encourages you to get right to the point. He says, get to the point. I already know what you're asking. Get to the point. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you, some of you do get to the point. Some of us, you know, even in public prayers, like, oh, God, we just, I just, you know, it's been a great day today. And, and it, there's one thing about, like, uh, talking to God in free form, but, but Jesus is like, look, you don't have to say a whole lot. Just say, God, I am discouraged. God, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to pay the bills here. Cover the basics. A disciple gets right to the point, talks to his dad. I've trained my son when he calls me. He, sometimes I told Dan, he calls me, and he, he, uh, uh, sometimes he just starts talking as soon as I pick up the phone. Like I'm on my way to get him, and I will see Daniel calling. I love my son Daniel. He gets right to the point about things. But when I hit, when I hit that, that, that button on my phone and I put it up, he's already talking about asking me questions. And so I've had to say, hey, listen, just say, hey, Dad, how are you? Hey, I'm fine, son. Thanks for asking. Hey, uh, well, how's your day going? Oh, it's going well. Ah, oh, incredible. Okay, now what is it that you would like? Our conversations are kind of like that, right? We talk too long or we just, just, but God is like, listen, I already know what you want. Like, acknowledge me, then jump right to the point. And then, this is the beautiful thing, wait and then see what happens. That's where Ricky talked about praying until you pray, that when you get right to the point and you give God the glory and you get right to the point and you have a structure and then you pray and you pray and you pray and then you wait to see what happens. That's where life gets interesting because as you start to pray, you'll find that as you talk with God, something begins to stir in you and you talk to him a little bit more like a person you would across the table. It's just, it's just the way that that works. 
the beautiful thing about private prayer is that Jesus leaves the how you go about private prayer is is totally left up to you. He says go into a closet, a private room, but it doesn't have to be a closet. It's it's more about being alone with God. Most days I try to find or create a space by walking my dog Ranger. I walk with Ranger a lot, primarily because I get to walk with him, and as I'm walking with him, um, I begin to talk to God because I'm alone. I turn my phone off. And some of you have dogs. You know, dogs take a long time to walk. Um, some of you are in the car for 50 minutes, 30 minutes, 15 minutes on the way to work. That can be your time away. Jesus doesn't say it has to be a particular way. He just leaves it wide open for you to pull away and to create some space. For those of you that, like myself, have a hard time concentrating, the Lord's Prayer is incredible. It's a, it's, I'm so grateful that Jesus says, here, let me give you a template. I use the Lord's Prayer because oftentimes I'm so scatterbrained, thinking about so many things about the day. And Do any of you else struggle with that? Am I the only one? Because it feels like it's just like a madhouse in my brain. I'm like, I, it takes me a hard, a long time. But then once I get that opportunity to settle down and talk, the Lord's Prayer helps me structure because then I think about the goodness of God. And then I think about the debts that I owe my family. I, I think about the ways in which I've sinned. And I begin to talk to him. And then I'm reminded of the grace and the mercy of God. And my heart begins to stir. And I talk to him. And I say, I'm so thankful. And then I say, you know what? The rest of the day is coming. My dog has finally taken his number two. And uh, I have to keep going. I, here I am at work. I'm in the parking lot. I, I've got to get on with my day. And I'm encouraged because I, I know that my father has heard me. This is what it means to be a d disciple in prayer. It's super simple. It just takes a decision to intentionally think, I'm going to make this a habit. Habits will change over a series of seasons of life. Right now, some of you are in the throes of juggling babies, You're just juggling babies. You know, Some of you are single, and you are um, working hard to save for the future. Some of you are students. Some of you are retired. It's a different season. That's why we can't compare ourselves in our prayer lives to other people. You know, I, you know, people that are not as busy as I am who are saying, man, I just spent a good three hours with the Lord this morning. I'm like, that's incredible. That's incredible. Good for you. And some people I talk to, they're like, I'm lucky to have like seven minutes of peace. You know, the kids are up at 5.30. Are anybody else's kids up at 5.30? Does anybody else have to be uh, at work at like the crack of dawn and they got to get up and get ready? Does any, anybody else have late nights, early mornings? S seasons will change. This is where we need to receive God's grace in all of this. Jesus was, one more text and then I'll, for those of you who are night owls, so Jesus says, hey, pull away. Here's a template. How you pray is, is, is uh, the structure is, is not demanded. But in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, Jesus has a busy day. And it says that he very early got up in the morning, chapter 1, verse 35, very early in the morning, he gets up. He goes out and he goes to a deserted place. And it's early in the morning and the disciples find him. Verse 37, everyone's looking for you. See, Jesus couldn't escape. Ricky said this last week. Jesus could not escape the busyness of life. Neither will we be able to. But, you know, he gets up very early. It's not magical. He gets up and that's most of the battle, getting up. He goes out. The battle's almost won. He brews some coffee. He did not do that, but he, I, I would suggest that maybe if he did, wouldn't that be, yeah, anyway, I, I always thought that'd be cool. Like, how did Jesus do that? Like, very early in the morning, like, uh, got up and had like a pour, like uh, the Middle Eastern uh, equivalent to a pour over. Like, I've been to the Middle East. They have some strong coffee. I wonder if Jesus was a coffee drinker. That's for another sermon. When he was done, he was done. They find him and they say, let's go. I love this because Jesus just, again, he just, the simplicity of he gets up, he goes out, he comes back, his kids find him, the disciples find him, and he says, let's go, and he gets on with his day. Life found him, and he, what he prayed for was enough. You see, Jesus was intentional, but don't think that it was easy for him. It was not easy for Jesus. He was human, just like us. But again, 
he knew that being alone and being silent before his father was going to give him life. It was going to give him life. The question that I want to put out there is that, you know, when you think about your prayer life and your relationship with God, like I said, this isn't like a, hey, what are you doing to be a better prayer? It's like, how is your relationship with the Lord? What, what can you do to strengthen that friendship with God? And talking with him is that thing that strengthens our relationship with God, no matter how old you are, no matter where you need to start. And so when we think about our schedules, the question is, what needs to be done? How, what do we need to decide to make silence in solitude a rhythm in our life, that we're pulling away. Some of you are night owls. Jesus was a night owl. Matthew 14, 23, he sends off the disciples and he goes in alone to to, to pray at night. He didn't burn the candle at both ends. As actually you see in the scriptures that he, his, his ministry changed and his seasons changed. Sometimes he prayed at night. Sometimes he prayed in the morning. Sometimes he pulled away midday. The question is, when you feel that nudge of wanting to get away, how do you respond to that? Are you responding to God's overtures of like, hey, you need to pull away. You know that Southwest commercial, want to get away? Is that Southwest? Is that the right one or is that Snickers? Hungry? No, that's Snickers. It's a question I know. Want to get away? Uh, the most recent one is the guy that steps into the car. Have you seen this one? He steps into the car and he thinks it's an Uber. <laughs> it's actually a bank getaway car. And all of the robbers come in here and they go, 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 go. And he's like, and it's like, want to get away? Sometimes we need to get away. You need to get away. So how do you do this? How do you get silent with God when life is super busy? Here's a few suggestions. Let me give you suggestions. How do we, how do, we do this? One some, some of us need a personal retreat. Some of you need to take a half morning on a Saturday. And this takes, if you're a family and you've got some family life, uh, you need to like do some coordination. But some of you need to pull away for a half day. Some of you need to pull away for a day. It might be a little bit longer. But one of the ways in which we can pull away is to schedule a personal retreat, to schedule, spend some time, and I like to take my Bible, I like to take a journal, to pull away, to withdraw, and to just, and to just ask God to, to just reveal some of the things in your heart that you need to talk about. And to pull away and say, I need to be alone. I know my, I know my kids need me. I know my family needs me. I know that I have a job. I know that I have this. Th those are not going to go away. For those of you that are are in desperate need of some silence, you just need to schedule a time to pull away and to sit before the Lord for a good chunk of time. If you can do that, that is a great, that is a great opportunity. There's lots of places we can go. You can, you can go to a park for a half day. You can uh, rent an Airbnb for a half day. You can come here for a half day. This place isn't used on Saturdays. Some days during the week, you could come here and you could sit in the quiet in the summertime. Another suggestion is to figure out how to have momentary daily retreats, withdrawing with silence. I, you know, you're, if you always have your earbuds in, if you always have your face in the screen, if the car radio is constantly on, if you are always doing something, uh, you decrease the number of opportunities God might have for you to just moment by moment throughout the day hear from him. You might start with five minutes in the morning. And then you might do like that 15-minute commute in the afternoon. You might think about doing a, a five-minute lunch break where you talk to God. Next thing you know, you're, you're already at 30 minutes there. If I were to say to you like, hey, you need to take an hour away each day. And you're like, that's impossible. I couldn't do a full hour. Well, if you do the math and you do like a five-minute time away and then a 15-minute listening to some Bible recording about some passages of Scripture and you've got a 20-minute car ride and then maybe just a few minutes before you walk into the house to retreat, to be silent, and to turn the radio off, you, you're at an hour, easy, every day, communing with God. It's not always going to be easy, but Jesus knew that when he was silent and he pulled away and he talked with God, his, 
his relationship with God was strengthened, with his father was strengthened, so that when he went into the crazy house, when he went into the workplace, when he went into that conversation with someone, that he was strengthened and loved. And in the quiet and in the silence, God strengthened him and saved him. One of the things that I'm reminded of is that Jesus in Hebrews is called an intercessor. And Jesus pulled away and was, was praying so that his work might be done. And Jesus has not stopped praying for us. He is our intercessor, and he's continuing to pray for us and for you. He loves you so much that he has pulled away, and he's interceding before the Father for you and for me. He's in, he's in the Father's presence, and he's praying for you and for me. And so in the same manner, let's pull away throughout the day. Let's pull away and begin to individually and corporately access that salvation that God promises, the reward of God's presence throughout the day. And I wonder what your life would be like. I wonder how it would be different.